Hello everyone, welcome to Repair Down. This is my show where I take apart a product to fix something and in the process maybe we learn a little bit about product design. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer so that's where I'm coming from. Today I have this beautiful device called the Model Cycles by Electron. This is a, a drum machine. It has six spots for sounds here. Uh, the sounds are generated in real time with some well-designed mathematical equations and the parameters of, the, of that math you can change on these knobs here. And also, uh, let me load up a blank pattern here. There are these, this row on the bottom with 16 buttons and I can, I can drop sounds into these little slots to program beats. So that's my bass drum and I, let's get a little snare in here. And maybe some hi-hats. Bring that back in. So there you go, that's a drum machine. They did a really good job at making this fun package and it only costs 200 bucks, which is I think quite an achievement. It has two drawbacks though. The first is that entering pitch on this row is a little clunky and their pinch information and there are no octave buttons. And then another drawback is that these pads are a little bit too hard to push sometime. So to get it to trigger, you really have to hit it commandingly, which is fine for one, but if you want to, to drum with kind of your off fingers on some of the pads, it gets a little trickier. You know, drawback, they're hard to push, right? Sometimes they're hard to trigger. But pro, they, these can actually measure the force I apply. So right now the machine's using my the force applied to modulate the loudness of the sound so I can be quiet or loud, quiet or loud. So I want to learn about, I want to learn about how to do that. I figure let's take this apart and try to hack these pads to make them trigger more easily. And while we're at it, we'll learn a little bit about how force sensitive pads work. I hear that um, a lot of people use these force sensitive resistors. So I think there might be one of these behind each pad. Uh, but I don't know. Let's go find out. What I always think of when I'm trying to find my way into stuff is that someone had to put this together. So, you know, if someone can build it, then someone can take it apart. Well, I think that there's four screws here, and I think they're hiding the screws of these rubber feet. And coarse threads tells, indicates that this is a, a plastic screw. One of the first things I see is that um, something I guessed, one of my big predictions was, was wrong. So I guessed that the main circuit board would be screwed to the back plate, but actually you can see here that the main circuit board is screwed to the front plate. In other words, the screws go this way, uh, like they screw in this way, when I originally said that the screws would screw that way. Now that I see it, it makes um, it makes perfect sense for two reasons. Uh, the first reason has to do with um, alignment, and the second reason has to do with force. One of the main functions of the main circuit board is, is you know, holding all these knobs and all these buttons. And for the knobs to work well, you want them to be well aligned. The knob should be well aligned to the hole in the front plate. And same, same for the buttons. That's X, Y alignment, like lateral alignment. But also, what I would call the Z gap is important too. So the distance between the circuit board and the front of the front cover is important because if the circuit board's too far back, then the button will be recessed into the system. Same for the knobs. And too far forward can be a problem too. Um, so by attaching the circuit board to the front cover, you, you minimize the, the alignment loop. Um, if, if the circuit board screws to the back cover, that's just one more link in the chain to misalign things. So now the second reason is, is a, about the load path. So when the users are using this, they're actually applying a lot of force to these pads and turning these knobs. And um, especially if your pads aren't sensitive enough and people are banging on them. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, you want to minimize the, the path of the load that the load takes. So it's best to resi you know, um, resist that load right at the source. If this were screwed to the back plate, if the main circuit board were screwed to the back plate, then when I pushed on the button, 
the load would go into the back plate, the whole back plate would bend like this, and then it would transfer the load into the screws and then through the screws into the front cover. Basically, every time you pushed a button, the circuit board and the back plate would bow backward. But by attaching the main circuit board directly to the front cover, you can um, you know, resist the load right at the source. And that's, that's why there are so many screws here because you wanna have screws near every button, especially the, the force sensitive pads, because um, the farther the screws are apart, the more leverage you have when you push on the circuit board. Because when I push here, I'm actually pushing on the circuit board. And if you, if you have a circuit board bend too much, like that, that fatiguing, that wiggling of the circuit board can eventually crack the copper inside the circuit board. So anyhow, long story short, circuit board is screwed directly to front cover with lots of screws. Look at that classy logo made in gold-plated copper. Well, now what I'm gonna do is take out all of these screws because Recall that my goal is to see how these four sensitive pads work. Oh, hey, something that's interesting. Every single screw so far has been identical. All the same screw. That's pretty cool. All right. All right let's see if this comes out. Oh, it's heavy. Okay. Okay. We're out. We're out. Look at that. That is something pretty, isn't it? Wow. These are the rubber buttons I was talking about. And it looks like it's all molded from one sheet. There are your buttons. Interesting. Okay, so each button, each button has got two little holes, two little holes next to it, and then molded into the plastic are little pins. Lots of little pins. So each button gets perfectly aligned. These, the four sensitive pads. So there's a sheet here. I bet you this sheet, this material here is the four sensitive um, resistor material. So I think that this is a sheet of this stuff. It's kind of interesting that they just put it on a bare sheet with no electronics on it. In front of the resistive material are more of the same um, electron pads, except these don't really move. Yeah, these don't have the, the travel that the other pads do. It feels more like a solid brick. And um, it's got this rubber shape on the bottom, and that rubber shape corresponds to the shape of the pad here. And you know, something that's interesting is there's no, um, like there's no resistive material in the middle. But no, now I recall that the pads light up. Each of these pads has lights and can, can light up. Um, so that hole in the middle must be for the light to shine through. And then the next question is why is there this dome shape where the light shines in? I think that that is a divergent lens for the light. So the light hits the sil silicone and this is a, um, con whatever <laughs> it's a lens that makes spreads the light out here's the circuit board and notice on the back side there's no components uh, to keep cost down it, it's a, it's easier to just solder all the components on one side if you can so that's neat and then looking on the front side it looks really beautiful look at all these cool patterns these are the four sensitive buttons and these are the the uh, the 16 step buttons and every single button has got a little light in the middle I wonder why they have like why they prefer to have four feet instead of one uniform contact surface. So this is one of those four sensitive buttons, and then these other ones are just the regular on-off switches, the on-off buttons. And the first striking dif difference you see is color. This one is brownish, and this one is greenish. So what's going on here? That green color comes from um, this layer called solder mask, which is in a um, a resin that we apply to control where we have exposed conductor and where we have non-exposed conductor. Um, so for some reason over here, they, they canceled all the solder mask. And my guess is that um, they're measuring changes in resistance. And sometimes the resistance of the solder mask can be can fluctuate if it absorbs water. Um, so by getting rid of it in this sensitive sensor region, um, they can prevent that from messing up the measurement. Um, I, if I line up my little sheet of uh, resistive material, um, the, the black pattern, which I think is the resistive, um, the material that changes with resistance under force, lines up with the comb pattern. Looking closely at the pattern, I think that you have um, two interwoven uh, wires. Uh, so let's start here, like this little L here, it skips the neighbor, and, and you look on, along the side here, it connects to its skip neighbor and again to the skip neighbor. And that kind of alternating connection uh, 
goes through this whole thing. Uh, so this is this would be wire one, and that's wire two. I think this is the brain. This is the cold fire MCF five four four one five CMJ two five zero. All right, I'm coming in trying to probe one of the force buttons. So this is the bottom side of the board. See these holes here? Th those are the screw holes. Apparently, there's a screw hole in between every force sensitive button, um, which kind of shows what they think is important. And I noticed that there are um, these test points in each of these sections here. And sure enough, these test points connect to one end of the force sensitive button, and the other end connects to ground. So um, I soldered a wire to the first test point, and I soldered another wire to a nearby ground. This happens to be the shell of one of the knobs. And uh, I found that ground point using continuity mode. It looks like this. Um, when your multimeter is in continu continuity mode, the probes beep when they touch. So you can use that to, to poke around and find a ground point. All right, I'm gonna probe this up, see you at the scope. All right, I got it working outside of the case. And these two wires are connected to both ends of T2. So blue is connected to the high side and black is connected to ground. Uh, let me show you what that looks like on the scope. So you've got lots of curvy shapes here. And the height of the curvy shape, let's call it a pulse. So the height of the pulse is 500 millivolts and the width is three milliseconds, uh, which is about 300 times a second. So 300 times a second is probably how frequently the system is reading these buttons. So um, I noticed that when I push on this button here, the shape of the pulses changes. So let's pause the music. So as I do a gentle push, the shape gets sharper and sharper. Oh, look there, it's quite sharp, but I still haven't triggered the snare yet. And now when I push harder, then it triggers. So you, so you have to, the shape of the pulses change as I apply force. And when the shape gets extremely sharp, you know, pushing quite hard, then it triggers the threshold value to um, make this button go. So what I think is happening is that each force button here gets a capacitor, which is like a, you can think of it like a bucket of charge. And the system, um, 300 times a second, it fills up the capacitor, it, it charges the capacitor, and then, it, and then it lets the capacitor drain through this force sensitive resistor, or I should say the capacitor discharges through the force sensitive resistor. And as I apply force to this, the resistance decreases, um, which is equivalent to increasing the diameter of the drain hole. And that lets the capacitor discharge uh, faster. And then the processor, either the, process, either the processor here or some kind of sub-processor is paying attention to these guys and measuring how long it takes for the capacitor to discharge. And by measuring the capacitor discharge time, it can estimate how much force we're applying to the bumpers. To confirm my theory about resistance dropping here, I've got my multimeter in resistance mode, probing the resistance across T2. And whenever you're probing resistance, make sure you disconnect all the power because you actually have to create a short circuit to measure resistance. And I've burned things when I'm um, in college, not knowing this. So power disconnected. And when I push on T2, the resistance decreases from 60 kilo ohms down to about one or two kilo ohms. So 60 and two. And interesting how slow it changes. I don't know if that slowness comes from the multimeter or from the force sensitive resistor. Unfortunately, I think that changing the dec decay time of this crazy thing is beyond my electronic ability, or I'd rather move on with my life right now. So I'm gonna declare this repair down, not successful. I need like a Mythbusters, you know, like busted or not busted. But anywho, this one busted me. So uh, thanks for watching. I'm gonna put this back together and just keep it and move on to the next project. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in, in synth stuff now, so uh, if you want to follow along with me, make my own synth, um, please subscribe and keep watching. All right, bye.